Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. Yes, this is a visit where we are interested in talking together about the Bible, that most wonderful, majestic book that God has given us, that, that wonderful book that comes from the mouth of God and is absolutely trustworthy and dependable and true and important, super important, because the Bible uh, is the only place in the world where we can go in order to find out what finally is going to happen to the human race, to the, this world itself. What is the, really the future? All kinds of people speculate, all kinds of people have their philosophical ideas, but the Bible does not come as a book of philosophy. It comes as an analytical book with the facts, the facts that uh, this is going to happen, That uh, and God gives us the timetable, and God gives us so much information that is super important. And these are the kind of things that we discuss on this program and are delighted that we can speak together and learn from each other as we uh, point out scriptures. Because finally, our authority is not our minds, of course. It is not a ch what a church creed carries. The, the authority is always the Bible, the Bible itself. But let's... This is your program, and we right now we'll take our first caller tonight. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Yeah. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, we didn't have a good call there. Let's try again. Good evening. Hello. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. Is this family radio? This is family radio in your eyes. Okay, on let me turn my radio down. Please do. Okay. What is your question? Uh, you were talking about a, uh, in uh, Revelation 18:4, where it says, Come out of her, my people. Yes. Okay. Now. Well, what is it talking about, come out of where? Well, the, the context is talking about Babylon. Right, come out of Babylon. Yes. Okay, now, where do we go to, if we come out of Babylon, where do we go into? Well, first of all, we have to decide what Babylon God has in view. You know, until the end of the church age, Christ ruled in the churches, he was there uh, in his Holy Spirit to apply the word of God to the hearts of those that he planned to save. Uh, but then God finished with the churches a few years ago, and he turned the churches over to, of all things, Satan. And Satan is typified in the Bible as the king of Babylon. And because Satan rules there now, and Christ has abandoned the church insofar as salvation is concerned, uh, and his only role with the church is, uh, is to bring judgment, and Christ uh, has placed Satan there uh, to bring judgment, or not to bring judgment, but to, uh, to uh, prepare, assist in the preparation of these world, these people in their churches for judgment as... Uh, as as wickedness will expand in the churches. Uh, therefore, uh, it has become Babylon. It has become the citadel, the palace, the uh, capital city of S uh, Satan's kingdom. And so now we have to come out of the churches. You see, outside of the churches, you asked a very fair question. Where do we go? We go out into the world. There is no divine organization existing any law, longer uh, that is man that is uh, ruled over by men that we are to flee to uh, before Christ before Christ 
went to the cross for 1,480 years, the, the d divine organization that God uh, used to uh, represent the kingdom of God to this world was the nation of Israel. And then back in A.D. 33, God shifted from the nation of Israel to the churches that uh, he designed and which sprang up all over the world during the next 1955 years. And then when their work was finished, and in the meanwhile they had become more and more apostate and, and were more and more in rebellion against God, uh, with their own do-it-yourself gospel and so on. Then Christ shifted again so that the only place we can find the truth is outside of the churches. Well, God, in the meanwhile, uh, has entered into the churches in his spirit to bring judgment, but Satan rules as an angel of light there insofar as uh, the people think. Oh, so there has to be a organization which has divine truth well no god is there god does not need a divine organization remember before the nation of israel the world had existed for 9500 years uh, that uh, that's the period of time when god talks about the flood of noah's day talks about abraham and isaac and jacob there was no divine organization that represented the kingdom of God. God was dealing with people on a one-to-one -one basis. And now we're back to that in our day where it is me and God. There is no divine organization. So there's uh, no uh, divine organization when we come out of Babylon to go into we don't go into another organization. We just go out into the world and serve Satan in the secular world, as we always have to do. We have to be obedient to government and so on. But we do not serve him spiritually out in the world. It's a little bit like, you know, remember when, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel were were uh, driven out of, taken out of Judah, out of Jerusalem, they became servants of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in their day. And they actually served him in a secular capacity, but they did not serve him spiritually. When he wanted them to do something spiritual uh, to serve him, they said, no, we can't. And they were willing to be thrown into the lion's den or to be thrown into the furnace. And so as we serve uh, 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 Satan out in the world, because he also rules in the world, we serve him in a secular sense, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but not in a spiritual sense. Now, those in the churches, however, because the local congregations are a spiritual organization that God had created, they are now serving Satan in a spiritual sense, because that's the nature of the churches, that it was a spiritual entity. And that's why we have to come out of them, because uh, we don't want to serve Satan at all in a spiritual sense. He is not our God. Christ is our God. And the only way we can serve him faithfully is to come out of the churches and, and our service to him is spiritual service is on a one-to-one -one basis. We don't, we don't have an organization that we can become a part of in order to serve him. But thank you for calling and sharing and you've asked some very good questions. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, how you doing? Very well, well thank you. Uh, God bless you, first of all. My question is, uh, can you explain to me the validity of Catholicism? Okay. Is there any validity to which? Yes. I, was, uh, I started out uh, raised as a Catholic, but just converted to Christianity about a year ago when I decided to give my life to Christ, and I want to know, uh, I preach, when I evangelize to the people that I work with, I preach that uh, Catholics uh, 
don't believe that Jesus is the only way. So I want to know the validity of Catholicism, of Catholicism. Kabbalism? Yes. I'm not really uh, familiar with that. I've heard the term, but I'm not really familiar with it. But the fact is the only place where there is validity is the Bible. The Bible. And if you are uh, sharing the gospel, you want to make sure that you are being faithful to the Bible. And that takes a lot of very careful study of the Word of God. Uh, because otherwise you'll be teaching, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord has not said. And that's an, a very serious matter. And so you want to be as, uh, you really want to uh, check what you're teaching against the Word of God so you can make correction in anything you're teaching. Now, but I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I can't, I'm not qualified to answer your question. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Kipping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Mr. Kipping, I have a question for you. Maybe you can help um, with scriptures, um, teach me uh, what, what I'm doing wrong or the Romans being wrong. But I'm, I'm looking at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse t uh, 12, where it teaches a woman not to teach. Yeah. Now, my question to you is, if we're in a, in a, in a group of um, a woman teaching children, and you have men that's in the out oversight of the room, are they allowed to be in the room listening to her teach the children, or should she be in a separate room by herself? Because she's a very good teacher. And she's really good with the kids. Well, but why did, why is the man present? Just like you'd like the oversight of the room. Well, but you see, you or you mean to ask as a helper to? Yeah, you know, just like like to maintain um, order. Um, or, order. Yeah. Well, I, I I don't know how to answer that question. Really, uh, the the intent is that a. If she is, if he is there to to be thinking he's going to be blessed by her his her teaching, then then she should not be teaching. If he is simply there as a monitor to help maintain order and so on, uh, uh, that one individual, I can see that as a possibility. But uh, uh, if if he is there in order to uh, uh, be instructed by her teaching then uh, I would think that, that would not be a very wise thing. Now, the, the whole question is, do we try to obey God's commands, uh, uh, but try to get, get as much leeway as possible, or do we try to obey God's commands and try to be as close to the truth in obeying them? And, and so my uh, if if I had a situation like that, I would really think it would be far better in this children's class if we had another woman to act as a monitor rather than as a man. Okay, so the best thing to do is for the man not to be in the room that would and be, as she's teaching. That would be a, a, a more, more conservative and careful way of trying to do God's will. Okay. Would that also relate to being at the end of the church age time now that we're all committed to come out of the churches and being that we don't go to churches and we're fellowshipping on, a, on an Internet, which is called Pal Talk. We have a bunch of people to come in with their children, and we have, you know, what they call admins that maintains the room. And well, I'm, uh, I'm having a conflict with this because I think that it's, it's against the, word, the rules of the Lord. Well, for I follow First Timothy two uh, two twelve. Well, for example, if you have a, a program of some kind on internet like Bell Talk, and a woman is going to write her opinion, and uh, because she wants to teach, uh, you you uh, wouldn't want you wouldn't want to have that on that pr program because uh, that that would simply be a, a violation of First Timothy chapter two. But if men are writing their ideas and trying to teach something, that would be perfectly acceptable. Okay. 
So then it, if I just say, well, then if, if, this, if the men are going to stay in the room, then I'm going to not anticipate in the, into the children's hour until she has her own room where she can teach the children. That's in a, like what I call a locked room. So men cannot come in and be under the hearing from a lady. And she's a good teacher. Well, well let's I, see. I, that, I this, wanna... this, the problem is, uh, you know, God is not discussing how good a teacher uh, a person is. There are many women today who are preaching in the churches because they're very uh, excellent uh, speakers. They uh, they uh, they are very charming. They are uh, they've had uh, they've learned the creeds of their church and so on, and uh, they really can. Uh, uh, put the man to shame because of their uh, uh, ability. But that's where the trap is. That's where the trap is. Are we going to, uh, uh, are we going to decide how this is to be done or are we going to listen to God? And you know, the women, they have a, a, a blessing that no man can have. A woman might think that she's disenfranchised because she can't teach like a man or take on the role of, uh, of uh, bringing the gospel like a man. Although she does have a prophetic office, she can share the gospel, she can hand out tracts, she can speak to an, an individual about the gospel and so on. But when it comes to teaching a class, she should really humbly back away. Now, you see, Christ, on the other hand, designed women to be able to do something that no man can do, and that is to bear children. And that's a glorious and wonderful blessing that God has given women that no man can enjoy. No man can have that blessing however they uh, would like to have it. And so uh, we have to follow what God decides, not what we think we want. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kemp, and you have a very good evening. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Well, good evening, Mr. Kemp. Um, I, I have a problem with Revelation 13.13 13 and 13.15. 13, I don't understand how Satan can make fire come down from heaven, and I don't understand how he can give life. You're talking about Revelation 13. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, I, that is a, a very, very interesting passage. Uh, and unless we understood that Christ spoke in parables and he is the word of God, everything in the Bible came from the mouth of God. And here God says in Revelation 13, uh, he says, uh, he's talking about Satan ruling in the churches. This is the whole context of the whole chapter of Revelation 13. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound of a sword and did live, and he had power to give life. Uh, oh, let me see. Uh, in in verse 13, and he yeah. doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, remember when when uh, 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 Elijah was uh, in a contest with the 450 prophets of Baal. You read about this in the cl- closing chapters of First Kings, and uh, at that time, those 450 prophets of Baal represented Satan's kingdom, and uh, they represented Satan. And what was the context? The context was, who could call uh, down fire from heaven? Correct. And, of course, uh, the 450 prophets of Baal uh, made an altar and, and tried all day long uh, to call down fire from heaven and could not at all. And then Elijah, who serves the God of the Bible, prayed a simple prayer, and fire came down and destroyed uh, the altar and even the stones under the altar and the dust of the earth and so on. Uh, Only God, uh, because fire from heaven signifies judgment, and Satan, because he wants to be like God and the supreme 
evidence of being God is that you are in charge of judgment. So Satan desperately wants to prove that he can also judge. But something happened in Satan experiences. When Jesus came out of the Garden of Gethsemane and he was uh, uh, addressed by the temple servants who were under the power of Satan, and Satan was present there in Judas, he had entered into Judas, and they asked Jesus, Who are you? And Jesus said, I am. Now, when Elijah, uh, earlier on, back in Second Kings chapter 1, uh, when uh, the wicked king of, of Israel tried to uh, have Elijah come to him, and Elijah wasn't about to obey him, uh, then Elijah called down fire from heaven, and the captain and 50 men came to take him, and they were destroyed. Uh, and here the Christ, who is greater than Elijah, uh, and Satan has come here to bind him. Uh, because Satan wants him killed. And and uh, Christ is not, uh, while he's going to allow himself to be bound, he is not going to obey Satan at all. And so when he said, I am, he does exactly what Elijah did. Uh, he call, No, he couldn't call down fire from heaven because he had to be bound. He had to uh, go to the cross. And so he couldn't call down fire from heaven. But he did something as a substitute. When they said, are you Jesus? He said, I am. And they all stepped backward and fell to the ground. Well, now Satan witnessed this. So, and he correctly got the conclusion that to fall, to fall to the ground, backward to the ground, is equivalent to becoming destroyed by fire from heaven. So yeah. that's what is exactly happening in many, many churches today. There are those who are representing Satan. They think they're serving Christ, of course. But Christ comes as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. They're really serving Satan. And they are able to, uh, to uh, uh, cause people to fall backward to the ground in a supernatural way. And uh, they even call that being slain in the spirit. It's really a phrase that is emphasizing that Satan is showing he has the power of judgment. But uh, that's, the, in other words, this is, this is the way that particular uh, statement of Revelation 13 is being carried out in our day all over the world. These, this kind of activity is going on. Thank you for calling. Then, yeah. uh, Mr. Camping, the same thing goes with um, giving, having power to give image to the, to give life unto the beast. Well, he gives life in the sense that he's able to do these miracles, like calling down, that is causing people to fall backward, or to get visions, or hear messages from Satan, looking like he is Christ uh, in a vision, or and so on. In other words. Uh, Satan appears like an angel of light. Now, an angel of light came to give life. And so it all it's all shaped up so that it looks like it really is bringing life. Although, ultimately, it is bringing death because uh, sin always brings death. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I'd like to ask you about the Thailand offerings. You, since as you say that's um, the end of a church, you know, age, I'm sending for the book. I'd like to find out what do you do about Thailand offering? About about offerings? Yeah, tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings. Because they can't do it in the church anymore. Yeah, well, but you see, why were you bringing tithes and offering? Uh, to the local congregation. The, the task of the local congregation, this is what the Bible calls for, 
but that doesn't mean that they followed the rules of the Bible. But the, the task of the church is to evangelize the world. They were made caretakers of the Bible, and they were to send that message out into the world. And so as people brought in their tithes and offerings to the, the church, uh, most of it should have been used to uh, to exp, exp, uh, to exp, uh, uh, send out the gospel into the world. Unfortunately, a lot of it is used for a lot of other reasons, but uh, that's uh, that's only again because of the of the rebellion against God's laws. Now we're not to we're, God is not using the churches anymore. So any means that we can think of to get that true gospel out into the world is where we ought to put our tithes and offerings. We can buy Bibles and hand them out. We can uh, join with other individuals in an organization like Family Radio, which is not a divine organization. It has no spiritual oversight over anybody, but it is simply... A, an organization uh, in which we, we uh, act as managers of the funds that people give in order to get as much mileage as possible in sending, <coughs> excuse me, in, to send the, the true gospel out into the world. So can I ask um, two more questions? What about the Sabbath day? Because... I'm really trying to find out about the true Sabbath day. Well, that's very, if we read, uh, if we, well, the fact is that the seventh day Sabbath was uh, in vogue from the time of, uh, 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 well, really throughout the Old Testament era, because it was a sign, it was a part of the ceremonial law pointing to the fact that we're not to do any work to get ourselves saved, just as they were not to do any work on the Sabbath day or they would be killed. Anyone who is trying to become saved and thinks he has made a contribution, he's reached out and accepted Christ, or he has uh, prayed the sinner's prayer, or he has been baptized in water, and that guaranteed or caused his salvation, uh, in addition to the fact that Christ had to pay for his sins, is still under the wrath of God. Hold on for just a moment. I'll get. I'll finish this. The Sabbath day of the Old Testament was part of the ceremonial law. That is, it was a sign pointing to uh, the spiritual reality which it represented, and that spiritual reality was that. We have to wait upon God to do all the work of saving us. Uh, it was a ceremonial law, just like a burnt offering or a blood sacrifice. Now, when Christ came and he actually did the work of making payment for the sins of all that he came to save, and that's what the cross was all about, uh, as God poured out his wrath upon him in equivalent fashion, to each of these individuals that Christ came to save, spending an eternity in hell under the wrath of God, then God was finished with utilizing the seventh-day Sabbath, like as a sign, as he was finished utilizing the burnt offerings and the blood sacrifices. And so he shifted from the seventh-day Sabbath to the first day of the week, but it's a different kind of a Sabbath. Uh, it is. We read this. Uh, this, for example, in in uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath, there was an era of Sabbath that came to an end, and there was a beginning of a new era of Sabbath. Sabbath that Sunday morning when Jesus arose from the grave back there in A.D. 33. And that Sabbath is part of God's moral law. God has given us that not as a sign, but it's uh, pointing to something, but as a need for our lives. We work hard all week, and, and uh, we have little time 
uh, to uh, look into the Bible and, and by the time we spend time with our family and all the cares of this world. But when Sunday rolls around, that is the new Sabbath. And that is the time for doing the will of God. It is called the Lord's Day because it belongs to Christ uh, as a day in which we are to seek only His will. And that, when God gives us illustration of how to use it, it has to do with with reading the Bible, with uh, with prayer, with sharing the gospel with others, and just uh, uh, being strengthened in our Christian faith. And God gives us 24 hours every week uh, set aside for that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening. I wanted to get your opinions on purgatory. What's your, uh, uh, what do you believe in that? What are your opinions of it? Uh, on which? On purgatory. Purgatory is a concoction of the theologians of the Roman Catholic Church. It is not taught in the Bible. When a person dies, his eternal destiny is sealed. If he died as a child of God, he immediately in his sole existence goes to be with Christ in heaven to await the resurrection of his body on the last day. But on the other hand, if he died not saved, he will go to a place of silence to await the resurrection of the last day when he will stand before the judgment throne. There is no purgatory at all. There is, okay, at the moment of death, there is a last uh, confession, so be it, of uh, the sins they acknowledged through your life. Uh, well, then there, uh, God will make a decision before you? Well, no, you see... That confession they're making has nothing to do with salvation. A, a, a priest can't save anybody. A priest can't forgive anybody. Only God can forgive. Are we, uh, the, uh, uh, it's that was a misunderstanding, uh, sir, but uh, I just wanted to say if you confess to God before death, shall well, it be uh, changed? It depends. If, if, if uh, to confess to God... Uh, the only true confession is when God has already saved us. We are of the same mind with God. Just to uh, come to God on our deathbed and say, Oh, Lord, I've been a wicked sinner, and oh, Lord, I've committed this sin and that sin, I make confession, that doesn't mean anything at all. The fact is that... that uh, uh, God has to do all the work of saving us, and and uh, it's up to Him whether He wants to save us or not. Now, God does teach us that we are uh, to strive, we are to be diligent in seeking that salvation, but we're never to seek it thinking that I can somehow work my way into heaven. We, uh, we are still de entirely dependent on the mercy of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And that's why, you know, right today, we are not telling people, now well, make sure you confess your sins before you die. We're not telling people, make sure, uh, make, your, make sure that you are saved. And, and God saves through His Word. And so read the Bible and, and try to be as obedient as you can and, uh, and pray to God for His mercy. Maybe God may have mercy on you too. You won't know until you become saved because God will only save those who are the elect of God. But He does command us to seek that salvation uh, with great diligence and with, uh, but not uh, with the idea that something we as we seek that we can somehow merit salvation or do something that will cause us to become saved. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes. Harold, could you read Deuteronomy 18, 21, and 22? Deuteronomy 18 verses 21 and 22 there we read 
And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. That, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Now you see why God gave that law. Before the Bible was completed, there was a period of 1,500 years when God did, when there were prophets. Some of them were true prophets, some were false prophets. And, and uh, the, the true prophets uh, would be faithfully declare what God had already written up to their time, and also occasionally God would give them additional information that they uh, were to declare to the uh, to the people, and they were true prophets. But alongside of them, there were false prophets who also taught many of the things that had already been written down and claimed that they had received a message from God, a direct message from God, that thus and so this would happen or that would happen. And the people, how could they tell who was the true prophet? And the only way they could tell is to wait to see if that prophecy did come true. And so it was a very difficult situation for the people of that day. But in our day, God has given us a much more uh, easy way to determine a true prophet from a false prophet. A true prophet recognizes that the Bible alone and in its entirety is the divine word. And if they're going to prophesy or declare the word of God, they know that their only source of truth is the Bible. And not only is it the Bible, but uh, they're going to follow the rules of the Bible that we have to compare Scripture with Scripture so that we will be as accurate as possible in what we are teaching from the Word of God. On the other hand, here comes someone who is very charming, very uh, 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 with a high theological reputation and who has a great following, and he declares, I received a message this week from God, and it was a wonderful message that I want to share with you. Instantly, we know that is a false prophet because he is coming uh, with a message that God could not have given him because God will not violate his rule of Revelation 22, verse 18, that we're not to add to the words of the prophecy of this book. And so we can immediately separate uh, the false prophets from the true. More than that, you might even have a prophet who is who is uh, uh, only declaring he's only uh, bringing the gospel from the Bible, but actually he's not reading the whole Bible. He's only bringing his church creeds. And, and there's many parts of the Bible that he doesn't want to teach or he doesn't think he has to teach. And then the question is, is he a true prophet or a false prophet? Well, he is, he's guilty of verse 19 of Deuteronomy 28, where God says we're not to, to uh, add or we're not to take away anything from the Word of God. In other words, the whole Bible is the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, the Bible says, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. And so, again, we can tell whether he's a true or false prophet by how he looks at the Bible and how much of the Bible does he really want to teach and how careful is he in, in searching through the Bible to make sure he has uh, uh, truth and if he finds out he's not being as correct as possible that he doesn't hesitate to indicate I was wrong about this and I want to be more correct in sending out the truth uh, when the end of the world didn't come in 1994 wasn't it proven that you're a false prophet no not at all because I was uh, like any uh, any pr person I was simply teaching what I understood from the Word of God. And even at that time, I was very careful to say, now, 
this is what it looks like at this time. I put a question mark after 1994, and I said, you know, we may have missed something. Uh, and I did. I was correct in that statement. I had missed something. And, and although in the same book I had also indicated the likelihood that 2011 might be the date. Now today I know a whole lot more uh, from the scriptures, but I'm still not, I still could uh, make a, uh, say something that is in error and have to make correction. But that's what every true prophet will do. They'll continue to search the Bible and make correction so that as time goes on, they become more and more faithful to the Word of God. I have one more question. Luke 21, verse 8. Luke 21, verse 8. Let's look at that. In Luke 21, verse 8, there we read... And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. And you see, uh, there are pastors and evangelists, for, for example, who are saying, We are bringing you, I am bringing you the true word of God. The Bible is infallible, and so on. And, and in other words, they're claiming that they're a part of the body of Christ, uh, that they are there in the name of Christ, and yet they are bringing their own ideas. They're saying, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord has not said. And, and this is going, all over, going on all over the world. Anyone who is faithfully bringing the Word of God as a representative of the body of Christ, as a part of the body of Christ, is going to uh, continually uh, be careful, as careful as possible, what I am teaching, uh, that it is faithful to the Word of God and is ready at an instant to make correction if it can be shown from the Word that he has not been teaching as accurately as possible. But are, we, are we, you still sitting on your great white throne? Well, I don't know what you mean by that. You know, a, a true teacher is not sitting on a great white throne. He is a humble servant of the Lord, just trying to be as faithful as possible to the Word of God. Now, I know that a lot of people uh, are very disturbed by what I teach and they slander and they vilify and they and they do whatever to uh, to engage in character assassination that's understandable I can understand that they are feel very threatened because uh, you know when we talk about judgment day and and say that the churches are under judgment that brings a lot of fear and a lot of, uh, of consternation in the minds of people. And, and therefore, they would like to, to uh, destroy the person that is, uh, or people who are teaching uh, about judgment coming in. But that's, that is, uh, those who are faithful teachers of the Bible have no option. We have to teach the whole counsel of God, even though it brings out enmity in others and slanderous statements and vilifying and so on. We still have to be faithful. We can't consider our own, our own skin at all. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. I'm looking at First Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3, yes. In particular, I'm looking at verse 18. Uh, verse 18, and there we read, And Samuel told him, oh, well, now, uh, uh, God has, uh, uh, Eli, the, uh, the, uh, Eli was the high priest uh, in, uh, in the uh, temple that was, uh, the tabernacle that was in Shiloh, that was before the, uh, the temple was built in Jerusalem. And uh, he was not very faithful to God. And so God raised up a child named Samuel. And 
at a very early age, uh, while Samuel was still a youngster, God began to give Samuel messages directly from God, which did not come, which did not come to Eli. And so uh, God has given a message to Samuel that was a very, very difficult message for Samuel to tell Eli. So we read, uh, uh, but after God spoke to Samuel, Eli called Samuel in verse 16 and said, Samuel, my son, and he said, and, and he answered, here am I. And he said, what is the thing that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God so do to thee and more also if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him everything, and hid nothing from him. And he said, that is, Eli, Eli said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. Now, what, have, what did Eli, what did God tell Samuel? Uh, and the message was terrible, was terrible. In, in, uh, the, in verse 11, And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Horrible, horrible statement of judgment against the high priest Eli and his sons who were also priests. And of course, Samuel did not want to give that to Eli, but Eli said, no, you have to tell me. And then Eli at least had the grace to say, well, whatever God declares, so be it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, thank you so much. I wanted to ask about uh, why do you think God created Satan and created sin? He did. I will take my answer off the air. Why yeah. did God create, in your, in your unique opinion, in your interpretation? Well, no, the Bible is very clear that God created everything very good. God did not create sin. God did not create Satan. Uh, God created everything very good. And, but, uh, but God has, uh, has law, and he established the law that in this very perfect creation, that if anybody rebelled against the law of God, that would be sin. Now, God did not cause anybody to rebel. Mankind rebelled out of his own heart. How he did that, that's a mystery to us. God does not disclose that to us. But mankind did. How it could be that many of the angels rebelled against God, headed up by Lucifer, who was also called Satan, that again is a mystery. But they were not created to sin. They were created perfect as ministering spirits, uh, and, and mankind was created to rule over this world as a perfect being. But, but, uh, but it is man who sinned, and therefore man, the law of God declares that there had to be the punishment, which is eternal damnation. And likewise, the fallen angels uh, have been judged and will spend eternity in hell. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold Camping. Yes. God bless you, brother. You've done a tremendous job. Um, I've seen uh, uh, a lot of uh, pastors and church leaders that are so afraid of uh, being asked questions about true Bible doctrines. But you, brothers, are not. You are bold. And uh, God bless you. And um, the people that are calling and revile against you about the 1994, 
they should not call it up and yell at you like that because 1994 is not is a is a title with a question and that is an uncertainty an uncertainty in it and so um the previous caller that just called you right now um you answer questions that um god did not create satan now can you explain that we created the angel, the angelic world, and the uh, we know that the devils headed up by Satan are fallen angels. We do not know they Satan was not created as Satan as an adversary of God. He was created uh, uh, perfect, uh, wanting to uh, to uh, he was created to serve God perfectly, but. Uh, somehow he wanted to be like God. He get, went into rebellion against God, and he uh, uh, fell into that rebellion, and so he became a d the devil, or Satan, or the dragon. He's called all of those things. So what you're saying is the result of sin is all this wickedness. Uh, the, the result of sin is Satan, and the result of sin is, is planet Earth. Is that what you're saying? Well, of course, that's why we have the tremendous wickedness in the world, because mankind uh, became totally infected with sin, with rebellion against God, because our first parents uh, began in re uh, had fallen into sin, and, and all of us in principle were in them, as the Bible says in in 1 Corinthians 15, as in Adam, that's our the beginning of the human race, all die. We all uh, were in principle in his loins, and so when he rebelled, we all rebelled in principle, and that's why as we are, as we are conceived, we're conceived and born in sin. We're infected by sin from the moment we're conceived. If God created the result, uh, the consequences of, of sin, does that sound like God ultimately and uh, know that sin is there? And I mean, if He already know that sin is there, doesn't it sound like God created sin uh, so that we somehow fall into it also? Well, now you have to remember that God is God. He knows the end from the beginning, and God. Uh, uh, how, uh, why God uh, allowed mankind to fall into sin, that's, uh, that's a divine mystery to us. But he did. Yeah, he did not restrain man from falling into sin, even though he had created him perfectly. And God knew that when he created mankind that he would fall into sin, uh, even though God is not responsible for that. But we know he knew it was going to happen because already the Bible teaches that already before he ever created this world, he had already made all the provisions for his salvation program, naming all those who would become saved eventually. And so on, all the details were all worked out. And Christ, as eternal God, was already chosen to be the one who would be the Savior. But that does not mean for one second that that made God the author of sin. He simply is, as uh, he created everything perfectly. God is, uh, there's no possibility of sin in God. So just like First Corinthians 13, uh, when uh, we try to search for the answers to every question we have, uh, there is a mystery that are not that our mind cannot uh, conceive to, to what God is. Uh, is that right? That's very good. In other words, now we look as in a mirror uh, darkly, uh, but then face to face, we we know in part. We don't know fully, and that's also emphasized in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, where we read. In verse 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, unto right. Jehovah our God. But those things which are revealed, and only God can reveal truth to us, belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So there, are, there are areas where we have to say, 
we have to leave that with God. That's a mystery God uh, has not revealed to us. Well, thank you, Harold Campbell, for your boldness and uh, for your continue in uh, in the Bible study. It's it, it's I, I love your your method, and uh, God bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good night, Brother Camping. Yes. Ezekiel 9, the whole chapter, and the beginning of... Uh, Ezekiel 9. Yeah, that is one of the most uh, uh, terrible chapters in the Bible, although there are a lot of terrible chapters in the Bible. But... Uh, uh, oh, no, excuse me. I, no, wait a minute. Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel 9. Uh, yes. Uh, where he is named seven individuals, uh, one of whom has a an inkhorn, and the other six have... Oh, hold on just a moment. We must remember the principle that Christ spoke in parables, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And Christ is the Word of God. And so all through the Bible we find his, uh, his uh, historical statements that, uh, or we find uh, stories that Christ tells that are earthly stories, uh, but we have to look for the spiritual meaning. Now here in Ezekiel 9, he's, uh, we're, uh, God is talking here about uh, 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 a, a six men with a slaughter weapon in their hand, and uh, they are to go into Jerusalem, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, we read verse 4, and first of all, the man with the inkhorn uh, and the uh, and the pen was to set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. That is, those who are the true believers are not to be included in the Holocaust that is about to follow. And then, once they have been marked... Uh, and actually from other passages uh, uh, the the picture develops that they were told to get out get out because God's judgment is on this is representing the local congregations and to, to the others he said in mine hearing go ye after him through the city and smite that means kill let not your eyes spare neither have ye pity Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. My, my, what a horrible situation. Now, you see, remember when God brought his judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam, those four cities, the men, the women, the children, every human being left in those cities, the only ones who escaped were Lot and his two daughters. All the others were killed with no mercy. Fire and brimstone came down and killed them. When the flood came upon the world in Noah's day, thousands of years earlier, except for the eight people, Noah and his three sons and their respective wives uh, who were in the ark, everyone else, men, women, children, babies, babies in the womb, were all mercilessly destroyed. Now, this is God's judgment upon sin. As long as God, uh, uh, as, as long as as uh, the gospel has been going out, God has warned that if we do not come to be, become a child of God, we are going to end up under the judgment of God. And he has warned the churches that, that judgment would begin there. And so those who are in the churches are in an, in an environment right now where God is judging. Now, we don't see... Uh, 
people lying in the streets being brought out of the church dead. No, it's a spiritual judgment. They are being prepared for their turn at the uh, tribunal of God's uh, judgment throne uh, where they will be found guilty and then be cast into hell forevermore. And uh, except that there is still the day of salvation, but there's no possibility of salvation going on in the churches under their supervision because God indicates he has left the churches. He's only there in his spirit to, to uh, in connection with his judgment program. But insofar as salvation is concerned, it is outside of the churches, out in the cruel, cold world. Uh, that is where God is saving a great multitude of people which no man can number. And uh, that's where you, you want to be if you have an interest in becoming a child of God. <coughs> but thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Harold. How's it going? Very well, thank you. Yeah, I just have a question. Um, and I understand that, that nowadays this is a moot point, but I am very curious, and it's church age. In the Old Testament era, um, as you have been teaching, the Old Testament shows us types of how things are in the New Testament. And you have said in the past that we were commanded to get together during the New Testament era until 1988 in churches on the Sabbath day. Um, however, in the Old Testament, the people only got together on very few occasions throughout the year. And I just want you to prove to me with the Bible that we actually had to go to church weekly um, because I'm not really seeing that as I go through the New Testament. It seems more like it's kind of like the Lord's table in that there was uh, no timetable, that it's just maybe the church was just there for um, occasional guidance or something of that nature. Uh, well, God did not make a specific statement, but when we look, for example, in, uh, in uh, Acts 13, uh, verse 43, now when the congregation was broke up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking of them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, uh, uh, that is the between Sabbath, which was the Sunday Sabbath, a day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. And you see, the the uh, uh, everything in the book of Acts indicated that the, that each Sabbath day there was a, uh, a getting together of the congregation. And God established the seventh day, the first day Sabbath as a time of religious activity, of, of uh, doing God's will. And the fact is that, that uh, he gave, uh, he, he uh, instructs people to become a part of a local congregation. God talks about uh, being under the supervision of those who have spiritual oversight over us. Uh, he talks about those who, their role of, uh, what their role is, and so on. The whole sense of the book of Acts is that on a weekly basis the church was to come together. And so uh, while someone can argue, uh, well, I can't find a specific statement that actually says I've got to go to church every Sunday, uh, the fact is, the sense of all of the book of Acts is, yes, the Sabbath day was a day for worship. Right. Well, you said we had to be under the authority of these people. I understand there are plenty of rules that guide the people that had oversight of the congregation. But, I mean, it seems as though it was more like it was just oversight. It wasn't a... I mean, well, can you give? I mean, I understand that it, that's um, that those verses are there. Well, that, the, the, that fact, the rules, but I mean, where do we have to be under their authority in, in that in that specific of a way? Well, the uh, uh, of course, like you say, this is all moot now. It doesn't uh, it doesn't mean any. Uh, but for example, in First Timothy five. Rebuke, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. We read in uh, uh, First Peter, uh, and I'm just, I'm just uh, speaking from memory here now. But in uh, First Peter, we read uh, 
the elders, verse chapter 5, which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, that is, not to make money, but of a ready mind, and neither as being lords over God's her heritage, but being examples to the flock. And... Uh, uh, so on and, uh, and uh, we have statements of this nature when we tie it all together the church correctly correctly saw that it was God's intention that we are to come together each Sunday Sabbath but thank yeah, I you just, I, I was just thinking about I guess it was just about the Old Testament more like that they that they were together on some occasion but it, it just seemed as though well, but wasn't. you must remember, it was an entirely different uh, uh, divine economy at that time. It was, uh, 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 the, the priests had a different role to perform. They had a whole lot more ceremonial laws to take care of, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and so on. But uh, 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 anyway, there's, okay. there's no yeah, point that's... in spending time on this question because we're, you know, we are past the church age. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold Camp, and I would like to um, have you read Isaiah chapter 18 right. and explain it to me. Oh, my. That's a very difficult chapter, and I couldn't begin to explain it in just uh, on this program. It is... Uh, it is uh, 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 it is. Uh, there are a few chapters in Isaiah that are very different, di very difficult. But uh, the, actually, the uh, part of it is in the translation. When it says "scattered and peeled," uh, uh, that sendeth uh, uh, a land shadowing with wings, that sendeth ambassadors to the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon a water, saying, "Go ye swift message." messengers to a nation scattered and peeled actually uh, that uh, if we work through this it means that they are are uh, uh, drawn and prepared for the gospel this is really a very difficult uh, uh, chapter that is ultimately addressing the fact that the gospel is to go into all the world to a people who are prepared for the gospel but to go into it right now, verse by verse, I would not be able to do that. Okay, can I, well, maybe the next time. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, Mr. Camping, how are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. You know the beast that comes out of the abyss that we read about? I believe it's Revelation 16. Revelation 20. No, it's also in, in 16 where he comes out of the abyss. He comes out of, uh, uh, in Revelation 13, out of the sea oh, okay. and out of the earth. Okay. And, and uh, that is uh, actually speaking about the same thing. Okay, well, he's got, he's got seven heads and ten horns, correct? Yes, but you notice that in Revelation 13, the horns are crowned. Earlier on, it talks about him having seven heads and ten, ten horns, and the heads were crowned. And that is because the crowning of the horns is emphasizing that this is when he is ruling during the period of great tribulation, when he was assigned the task of ruling over the local congregations as they are uh, being prepared for judgment. The question is this. I believe it's Revelation 17, where God talks about five of the heads have fallen. One is, and one is to come for a yeah. short time. There it's talking about the rule of Satan right from the time that he began to rule in, in, uh, at the time Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and going all the way till the end. But when he talks about the ten horns being crowned, then he's talking specifically about the time 
of uh, the Great Tribulation, which coincides with Judgment Day. What are the five heads that have fallen, and, and the one is and the one is to come? Is that all well, Satan? Well, you see, I, uh, this was written about 2,000 years ago. And if we divide the 13,000 years of history into seven pieces, uh, each piece is almost 2,000 years. And at the time this is written, it's, uh, uh, it was in the time of the rule of Satan in, with the sixth head. It was in the sixth uh, period of almost 2,000 years, and, uh, or right near the end of that. And there was one more period of about 2,000 years that had to be followed. In other words, as near as we can tell, that is referring to the fact that Satan's rule has been going on uh, for a long time and is slowly on getting to the end. Uh, and then just one comment. Um, you know, with all the information uh, from the biblical timeline leading to our day is most likely being the end of time, uh, playing the devil's advocate here, and excuse the pun, but let's say we make it to 2012, which I don't, I can't see how we how we can, but let's say we make it to 2012, then what? what I mean, how can the Bible then be trusted well, after all this information? Well, now, you see, that is the whole question. Do we trust the Bible? But we have to remember, we we... As we continue to search the Bible, we fine-tune. I find in my own life, as I talk about the nature of salvation or any doctrine of the Bible, uh, I will make minor corrections as I learn more and more from the Bible. Back 12, 14 years ago, I indicated the high likelihood that 1994 could be the end of the world, uh, but I... I, I, at that time, was quite sure that there, there was a good possibility there might be other information that had to be offered. 1994 is still an exceedingly important year in God's timetable for the end of the world. A very, very important year. But it is not the end of the world. Now, at this present writing, our present uh, revelation that God has given us, Everything points to the likelihood of 2011, but that's five years away. And in the meanwhile, not only I, but thousands of others are continuing to search the Bible and search the Bible. Uh, and, and in time, if we are in error someplace, we can make a correction. And, but but we, we cannot question what we learn from the Bible. We have to say, this is the Word of God, and and stand on that, and we'll let we'll let God worry about what happens if 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 we missed it someplace. There's no other year. I mean, after 2011, just nothing else comes up. Well, but we're not to 2011, and we're not from everything we know right now. I uh, and and I must admit that uh, I have been. Uh, I'm try checking and double checking and triple checking and trying to look at any verse in the Bible that might impinge upon uh, this uh, timeline of history. And God has given us an enormous amount of time, time information. And God in tells us in the Bible that this is his expectation for the true believers that we will know time. And so... Uh, just as we finally come to the point where we say, I trust what God tells me about salvation or about the fact that there is a, the new heaven and the new earth, so I also trust that what this time information is true. And we just leave that with God. Let God uh, worry about uh, how... Uh, how it's all going to develop. All we can do as a faithful teacher is teach as faithfully as possible, pointing out from the Bible why we teach what we teach so that people will not trust in me. They will have to trust the Bible alone and make their own decision finally. You don't think it hurts the trustworthiness of the Bible if, we, if 2011 isn't the year? Well, excuse me. We don't. I don't. I don't even think about if it isn't the year. All I know is that God has given us 
what we what we know to the present, and yet we can we continually search the Bible in in case we miss something. And I think by the time we get to the year 2011, we will know uh, with a great certainty, uh, much greater even than today, that indeed this is the time. And we don't have to even think about the question, what if it doesn't didn't happen? Lee, let God worry about that. I don't worry about that. All I know is that as a teacher, I have to be as faithful as possible to teach what the Bible is saying and and and... Uh, uh, and I pray constantly that God will lead me into truth not only I but as I indicated thousands of others and we we know that we do know this that what the Bible is teaching is the Word of God the Bible does not have any lies in it it has the truth it is true that the Bible is very very complex and we have to read it very carefully comparing scripture with scripture we also know however that god guides those who are seeking truth if we do so very humbly and faithfully search the scriptures god opens our spiritual eyes to truth the very fact that we know so much about the calendar of the bible in our day which was not known in previous generations is indicative of the fact that God is revealing these things to us and they and uh, like for example we've been teaching for years now that we're at the end of the church age that it is over and there has not been one thing found in the Bible or out in the world in the church world that contradicts that truth uh, we can be very very certain absolutely certain we've come to the end of the church age and if that is so then it means we're in that time of great tribulation it means we are right close to the end and it also means that in all likelihood according to our and, and altogether in, in accordance with our present uh, as so far as we know at present uh, 2011 will be the last year but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum yes good evening brother camping yes uh, a question on uh but I, it's funny that i'm the new the old testament and the new testament i'm kind of come should we go back on the old testament and still study it and learn it or just stick with the new oh, on the, uh, oh now what does the bible say all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof and correction and training in righteousness the old testament is every bit every bit as important as the new testament fact is most of the information that tells about what's going on today in the churches and in the world and what god's plan is is found in the old testament uh, and uh, so if we do not study the old testament just as fervently and carefully as the new testament there's no possibility of coming to truth of really knowing what god's plan is i see okay so knowing the the scripture of the old and new that's what i wanted because i figured i'm the uh, last generation here and i was wondering it's as I read the, uh, and I bounce back and forth, I seem to little understand better than new ones because I'm the, of the old, let's say, uh, Sabbath was on a Saturday in the Old Testament, which now it's Sunday. So I really want to go back to the old way and just not to the new way. Well, we have to hold, use the whole Bible. We don't use the Old Testament exclusive of the new, nor the new exclusive of the old. Yeah. We are, we read the whole Bible and it's all one piece it, every word in the bible in the original autographs the original languages in which it was written were right from, was right from the mouth of god and and therefore it's super important and when we read something in genesis or ecclesiastes or ezekiel or ruth or esther it's just as important as if we read it in matthew mark or Luke or John or Revelation 
Oh, I see. Okay. One more, Brother Clem, question. Uh, Brother Canton, so it's figuring that the church ages are over, and I know you have spoken about it plenty of time in uh, understanding. When you say Christ spoke in parables, I'm kind of lost. Not in our language, but it, I guess it was a different type of language? No. When he spoke in parables, it means he used earthly language. He uh, He gives historical facts everything in the Bible is absolutely true every historical fact is absolutely true because it came from the mouth of God uh, and uh, uh, we can trust the Bible implicitly but the message of the Bible was not simply to give us some historical facts it is also it is the the big message is the spiritual message of salvation and of all the things that enter into that, uh, God's, God's salvation program, His judgment program, and so on. But in order to understand that, we have to look through these historical earthly statements to find the spiritual meaning of what God had in view in, in teaching about this or that. And Christ gave an illustration in the New Testament. He spoke about the a sower that went forth to sow. He, here he is simply telling a story rather than speaking of a piece of history, but it's the same difference. Uh, a sower went forth to sow, and the seed fell on different kinds of soil, and therefore there were different uh, uh, yields from that seed. And then Christ explained, the sower is the one who brings the word of God. The seed is the word of God. The fields is the world. The, the different kinds of soil in which the seed fell was the, are the hearts of men. And the uh, fruit that came forth has to do with those who, the, the number of those who did become saved because of the word of God. And so the... Uh, the uh, God is explaining uh, how you are to understand a parable. And so th that, is, that means that wherever we see anything in the Bible, that as it stands, it is not talking about something spiritual. We have to look for a spiritual meaning. Now, God gives rules as to how we are to do that. We're not to look outside in the world to find out what could that mean. We're to look into the Bible to find clues as to how God uses that phrase or that uh, f that figure or whatever it is as to what that might mean. For example, whenever we see uh, the, uh, the word field in the Bible, we can normally recognize, if it's in a nursery story, that God is talking about the world. Whenever it talks about a mountain in the Bible, we know that God is talking about a kingdom, and the context will show whether it's the kingdom of Satan or whether it's the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so on. I see. So, but why do you make it so, uh, Brother Campin? Because I've been trying to study for a little bit of a while. And it's really it's, confusing for me to. Oh, it is very difficult. <laughs> I I struggle all the time, and 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 there's no shortcut. We have to spend a lot of time in the Word. That's why, as a teacher, I'm glad to give people a head start. At least uh, uh, this is what I see in this verse, and now they can listen, and then they can check it out to see whether that is possibly true, what I see. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.